everyone, how are you? Good morning. Nadal Shami. I'm a physician by training, actually. Co-founder of CityMD, which if you're, if you're from the New York area, I actually was about to look at my watch. Uh, I, I know it's still morning time, but I have a one-year-old daughter who's stealing everything from my bedside every morning, so I don't, I don't have it with me. I, I think I almost forgot my cell phone this morning, but, uh, but I got here on time. Um, I'm a physician by training. We started CityMD, if you're not from the New York area, about, uh, about nine, ten years ago now, as a physician practice. We, I, could, I, could, I could definitely tell you at that time we did not uh, necessarily know exactly what an MSO was. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through, um, through the CityMD story for those of you who maybe haven't heard it before. And, and these slides are actually outdated. We, uh, we completed a transaction very recently. And so now I think the official name is uh, Summit City MD. It's not the final name, but we completed a uh, merger with uh, Summit Medical Group, which is a physician group in New Jersey, which we just closed over the summer. Um, I can touch on that briefly, perhaps at the end of uh, this quick presentation. What I'm gonna talk to you about is not only the City MD story, but also, um, our growth uh, specifically, and perhaps what was a little bit different um, as a provider group growing up here in New York and the, um, the strategy we took and the approach we took to growth. Um, and hopefully it relates to uh, some of the providers in the audience. So who are we? What are our pillars? What's, what, what, what was the strategy we took? I think I'll start with, with who we are. Um, so CityMD, as I mentioned, is a provider organization. It started about 10 years ago. Uh, the, it was very simple, actually. We were eight physicians, and we figured uh, we would do four urgent cares, and that would, that would be it. We, we were all employed as emergency room physicians at the time, uh, North Shore, what is now Northwell, North Shore LIJ. Um, and the system, was, the system was challenging to work in, uh, to say the least, as a provider several reasons. I think largely practicing medicine for most physicians out there, the physicians in, in the audience. Um, but the actual practice of medicine was difficult and challenging. I would often come home, uh, I've told this story before to, to, to a few folks, but I would come home with a note card in my pocket and I would go over the initials of the patients I would see that particular day and the number kept getting smaller and smaller. I would see 20 patients and I would be really happy that I delivered care to 20 patients and then 18 patients. And about two years into it, that, that note card became about 10, 11 patients after working 14 hours. And so um, something was fundamentally broken there in terms of our ability to actually just practice medicine within the, within the system 10 years ago. And, um, and that's really part of the genesis of how the, our physician group started. It was, um, it was twofold. It was doctors who wanted to practice medicine and deliver care and not be burdened in, in, a, in a heavily administrative system. Um, and it was also, as an ER doctor specifically, uh, and this gets to our growth strategy, I promise, but as an ER doctor specifically, we wanted to be closer to the consumer. And we did not realize we were building at the time that that, that, that thought process um, really led to what I consider one of the largest direct-to-consumer um, retail healthcare plays in the country. But it was from that vantage point that how do we get closer to our customer first? Um, and and that, that really was just, was just born out of the fact that as an ER doctor, and if hopefully, I'm sure some of you have been to the emergency room, hopefully not often, um, you're really not liked as a, as a human, right? So that's just a difficult place to be in for a long time. And, and I don't blame the, I call them customers, and it's a different topic, but I don't blame the patient or the customer. Um, you're there for eight hours, the environment is horrible, um, and you're just fundamentally upset. And at the end of the day, this guy comes in or this, uh, this lady comes in with a white coat and spends about three minutes with you. And, um, and it's completely understandable to be, to be really upset. Um, so, I think my slides are just fine, but that's okay. Um, so, we, uh, we didn't love that. And we, we figured if we could start a, a practice that was able to solve for our basic need to practice medicine, and could get us a little closer to the customer and maybe potentially 
um, change their experience. Uh, and that's the way CityMD was founded. And today, from there to today, we have 130 centers, mostly uh, all really in, in New Jersey and New York. We have a few satellite offices, which is under a different structure in Seattle. But New Jersey and New York, 130 centers by the end of the year. We service about 3 million visits a year this year. Um, we've touched uh, roughly 6 million uh, unique patients across the New York and New Jersey market. Um, and on the city MD side, these numbers are now have fundamentally changed. But on the on the urgent care side, um, about 450, 500 plus providers. On our SMG side, which is a multi-specialty uh, multi-specialty group, 900 plus providers, uh, almost a thousand, I think, by the end of the year. So uh, currently a 15, 1500 provider-based system. But I'm going to focus on the city MD story for now. Um, although the, 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 new, uh, the new company is actually really exciting as well, so maybe I can spend two minutes at the end on, uh, on, on what that growth strategy looks like. But, um, but our, our provider-based growth uh, was, was, really, um, was really bringing on emergency physicians out of an environment which was not very difficult. We, uh, we got a lot of feedback from uh, a lot of smart people early on that provider acquisition was going to be very difficult. Um, it proved to be quite the opposite for us, um, actually to the extent where we would have, uh, we were rejecting about 50% of applicants, uh, physician applicants, um, just because the provider pool was very attracted to the idea that this platform was a, not only a direct consumer platform, but really built around um, providers and allowing them to practice medicine, which was, which was a big, big change. Um, we, we, after the company kind of got its footprint, we got to about 20, 30 centers, um, and we realized we had a little more than just a direct-to-consumer platform. Um, we realized that not only uh, does the patient obviously matter, and I'll get to our alignment in a second, the patient or the customer matter, but um, what our role could be in the ecosystem to actually uh, change the cost of care. And that's something we did really early on. We were probably about 12 sites when we developed our aftercare program, um, which, I'll, which I'll touch on. Um, and the company continued to grow based on three basic premises, patient, payer, and provider. And, um, and we really doubled down on that thesis uh, early on, about year three or four, um, when uh, we, we saw some significant growth due to, uh, due to our contracting strategy, which I'll touch on. So as it relates to, um, as I thought about this, as it relates to um, our growth pillars and, and retrospectively, looking back now where we are today, looking back now as an MSO um, and how we started, we, as I mentioned, we were a direct-to-consumer business. And, and I'm going to touch on that in our actual growth strategy and why that, that is uh, different from uh, the multi-specialty players we've seen out there who have focused on, at least now we're getting the perspective of physician acquisition versus customer acquisition. And um, I think you build towards a different thing. It, it's, a, it's a subtle difference, but a difference that I think is very important as MSOs consider how they plan to grow in a particular market. And so for, for, for us, and I think for most, for most out there, I heard, I heard some of the speakers earlier talking about um, uh, value arbitrage in terms of structuring, which I, I agree with, um, but I would add that as you consider growing your MSO, these are the pillars or the four legs of the stool that we would think of. Um, one is intellectual capital. I think it's, um, it's obvious that people drive, people will drive your business, but when, when I think about intellectual capital, I'm not specifically talking about the C-suite in an MSO or even the physician leadership. For us at about, I think, combined now, we're going to be probably about six or 7,000 employees. But um, middle management and the people who are driving your vision and culture in your, uh, in your practice and your MSO, uh, having a very clear alignment strategy for your business um, to deliver, ultimately, your value proposition. 
Uh, financial capital is something that I think a lot of people have spoken about up here and will continue to talk about, but our structure specifically, in, uh, as opposed to an independent, independent physician practice, obviously um, allowed us to structure our deals in a way that was uh, conducive to growth. Um, and then the last two, market access and infrastructure. Market access is where I actually want to spend a lot of time in terms of how we grew. Um, and so I'm going to come back to that. And infrastructure is the operational processes, consistencies um, that you're building as you scale your MSO uh, across a particular market. So on the market access front, which is where um, we spent a lot of our time, we wanted to initially focus on uh, what I'll call the first floor lobby. And so we wanted to focus on how do we get the the core customer in the door. Um, and that lobby was built on the idea that, you know, as a, we, we're essentially a retail healthcare play. Um, and, you know, that word has negative connotations. I, I, can, I appreciate that. But for us, I, I don't mean retail as in CVS retail. Um, I mean retail as in, um, as in physical Starbucks-like locations. We were competing for the customer at um, at the corner of where Dwayne Reed's would be, of where CVS was. Um, and we were competing for them based on uh, brand and convenience and allowing them to enter, enter the funnel, if you will. And that's where, uh, that's where I think we differed a bit from uh, some of the other players. Um, it, is not the hardest, it is not the highest margin entry, right? Obviously, if someone enters um, into your cancer center, that's a very different story. If someone enters your system via orthopedics and needs a knee, that's a different story. But uh, for us, the focus was if we could, um, if, if we could, and we are, uh, have a direct -to consumer play where we acquired the customer and actually gained the customer's value, we could eventually leverage that position into the broader ecosystem. We knew the second and third floors would be there. But customers were looking for a very specific direct-to-consumer experience and solution. Today, the three million visits that we, we're, we'll see by the end of the year, um, that customer NPS is a 72 for us. Healthcare nationally is a 17. Um, that uh, wait time for us on average is eight minutes uh, to see a provider. The total throughput time is about 42 minutes to enter our facility without an appointment. These are completely unscheduled. Um, which speaks about infrastructure, the, the, the fourth pillar, but completely unscheduled across from, from uh, the North Shore, Suffolk County to New Jersey, um, a customer can walk in and be seen by a provider and have a really high quality experience with, a, uh, uh, with great care. And so we, we believed strongly that if we could reproduce that direct consumer first floor lobby, we would be able to continually build a vertical value proposition and we could get there in time. And so that alignment, that, that alignment change or that alignment, you know, I, I our, our, uh, my partner, Richard Park, would often say God country man, you know, the Marines have this motto, God country man, and it's supposed to, it's supposed to guide you. Um, I don't think they would have time to pull out a manual. And so God Country Man is the way the Marines were taught. Um, and so for us, our version of what comes first was patient payer provider. And, and forgive me for the health systems in the group out there. Um, I know a lot of people say patient first, et cetera. But um, if we're not, this is being recorded, that's fine. If we're not going to, uh, if we're not going to kid ourselves, for the most part, it is provider. Um, a lot of the health system has been built on uh, the provider's vantage point. Everything from, I was in a marathon meeting the other day about patient scheduling, you know, 1,500 providers. And so if, <clears throat> if you're going to build your platform around the provider first, it's not right or wrong, but the outcomes are going to be different. And um, the discussion I often have, and I'm a physician so I can say this, is that it is not that the providers are not fundamentally important and a critical part of the system. They add tremendous value. Um, and I feel like it's analogous to an airline pilot. A really important position, right? I, you need to land the plane. No one is going to argue that. 
But when I was a kid, they actually used to clap when you landed, um, which is kind of a little bit silly. It's like a, the clapping that your surgeon actually got the appendix right. It's, it's actually just his job. I mean, I know it's a big deal. And I, you know, I, I, as an ER doctor, I put wires into people's hearts and you know, paste them, but um, very important. But I, I'm supposed to know where the heart is and I'm supposed to know how to, how to do that. So not taking away from providers, um, you know, incredible value add to healthcare, but just reframing and reorienting the orientation of patient, provider, payer, and if you can get your system, which is, or your growth strategy around an orientation that you think is conducive towards your growth. So for us, it was hypercritical to do that. Um, again, because we believed that if we were closer to the customer and we were able to fundamentally gain their value and trust, we could leverage that position through the value chain which we know ultimately ends, and it's different for every customer, so this isn't a universal, this isn't a universal thread, right? But um, ultimately there is a total cost of care that you're trying to solve for, um, or that you should be trying to solve for, because your, your payer is your, your client as well, which is why we have them second. Um, and we openly say this to them, we don't, this isn't like the pay, this isn't the provider slide or the, the patient slide and then we have other slides for our payers. Payers know they come second in our, um, in our algorithm. And so um, we're going we're gonna to solve the payment problem, but we believe we solve, I'm sorry, we're going to solve the value equation, but we, le but we believe you solve it first by addressing the core needs of your customer or your patient. Um, payer is kind of obvious. Uh, we would generally think of payers, however, in a, in a lot of different categories and buckets as a provider group. You have your traditional payers, you have your commercial market, you have your at-risk market. I don't think we need to, that's a whole different uh, discussion. But for the uh, provider systems out there, um, uh, you're, you're figuring out what your target audience is. Um, and providers would come, would come third in this. Um, again, not because the value is different, but because um, ultimately, we are serving, uh, we're serving the patient. And I, I believe that we actually built a platform uh, with our uh, initial 450, 500 plus providers that is fundamentally different than how they're practicing today. Um, I, would, I would see, I mean, well, early on, I don't see patients anymore. It's been a really long time since I've seen patients. Um, but we would see 50 to 60 patients a day in a given shift uh, at our centers. And it didn't feel exhausting. It actually felt incredibly rewarding because we built a platform that allowed doctors to actually sit at the bedside, spend seven or eight minutes with a patient without typing into an EMR, um, without having to worry about, did I call this person, did I refer this person, but actually delivering care. And by the way, seven minutes is a eternity if you're actually listening and delivering care. It's probably more time uh, than we spend with our spouses actually listening, right? So it's a lot of time, um, and, uh, and patients appreciate it. We have a whole talk on the perception of time at CityMD, um, and the, the, uh, if your doctor ever sits down on a stool, makes eye contact with you, and actually puts his hand on your knee, I, I will promise you, you will, you will believe that you're getting the best care possible. He might be a horrible doctor, but you will believe you're getting incredible care. Um, and then finally, our partners, which um, we've had great partners, uh, we've had great sponsors, we've had sh obviously our shareholders um, and our sponsors, and they don't love, you know, I don't know if Warburg's in the room, I think one of, someone from Warburg was supposed to be here, but um, they don't love to see themselves laugh, but, uh, last on this list, but I think um, if you find a right partner who agrees, to your, uh, agrees with your alignment, which is hypercritical, obviously, in any, uh, any financing for your business, um, uh, they'll be glad to see themselves there. So specific to us, um, the last part of this, I spent a lot more time on that initial part than I thought. I'll go through these last few slides of how we grew and uh, uh, we, again, we, we took a different approach and there are two, there are multiple growth strategies out there. Um, there's going through, uh, going through the traditional route in terms of acquiring physician and physician practices. Um, this specific growth strategy was specific, uh, this, this growth strategy was specific um, as a direct to consumer strategy. So we took, and we actually did not meet with health systems early on. I spent most of my time with 
um, Starbucks, McDonald's um, folks. And we just really wanted to understand um, how do you enter a market as a retailer? Um, how do you enter a market? How do you make that entry attractive for your customer? How do you get people in the door? And our thesis again was that if we get them in the door, we will add value and they will come back. Um, the way we added that value for us was through um, uh, mostly proprietary IT and, um, and human capital infusion. We would do about 2.2 million calls, this was two years ago, on just care coordination. So they would come in for something relatively benign. We would look at, um, we would look at, uh, at the patient a little more holistically than they would be expecting at the time. Um, and we would solve upstream problems for them. We would get them to the right referral. We would get them to the cost-effective orthopedics, et cetera. But um, we spent a lot of time actually initially in that DTC space and we focused just like most retailers would actually and, and, and most of the groups out there are sitting on a massive amount of data. Um, and if you can mine that data, uh, we literally know what type of milk and what type of uh, uh, laptop our customer prefers by region and we actually name them, uh, but um, you know, in, in, in Harlem versus Tribeca, you have a different customer base, um, and, uh, and we, we actively target them as, as, a, as a retailer would. So the data aggregation is critical to your growth strategy if it's through a retail model. I would argue the same is true if it is through a traditional physician acquisition panel model, um, which we're currently building out. Uh, I'm not going to have time to talk about this, but uh, we, tr we have a triangular approach because no one size fits all. I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Yeah, went way over time, apologies. But uh, this is our current footprint. And um, as I mentioned on this last slide, the DTC model was built on brand and retail. Um, know your customer. And, um, and that's just one strategy. There are obviously a lot. I'm going to stop there and answer any questions if there are any otherwise. Yes. My wife tells me I'm a talker, so I kind of extend past the slide, yeah. so I apologize. Excellent. Um, so my question would be, when you develop the strategy to become more retail oriented, and then you recently did a merger with Summit, because they're you know heavy on the specialist side, was the, the second part of the strategy then to build the specialty component within that network and in that geography? Yeah, so the, the strategy was always to, um, uh, to, to get to a state where we could reduce the cost of, care, reduce the cost of care and improve outcomes. Yes. Um, whether that was through an acquisition through Summit or whether that was through unique network building. So we work very closely with Mount Sinai. We have a cardiac program with them where we can identify in real time um, patients who fall into this gray zone of risk. It is not someone who's having a heart attack that obviously is going to the hospital, but a 40-year-old male who maybe needs an immediate test that could save him from a three-day admission and a $40,000 healthcare bill, um, who is healthy otherwise, where we could capture that patient through a partnership relationship, an in-network relationship, get them to a same-day cardiologist, and, um, and change the cost curve. And so for us, it wasn't, um, we were rather agnostic. I think we still, well, we're not exactly that agnostic anymore, but um, we were, uh, we, we still believe in the same thing. We're gonna, we're, gonna say, we're gonna find a way to improve outcomes and reduce the cost um, relative to where it is today. And so whether it's through partnerships or whether it's through building our own verticals, um, we are continually and will be aligned around that, that, cost, that cost bending. Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna push. I'm just gonna make one comment first. I'm not sure that patients really uh, appreciate that terminology anymore. 
So I, I think there is a large set of patients out there who no longer think of the healthcare system as their primary care provider, but it's uh, becoming more of a membership-based a la carte, I will choose. Um, and the role of the primary care provider, while I agree with the other panels, primary care is a very hot sector because it's acquiring patients and there's attribution, there's value to be built in. But um, you can do that in several ways. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if you can acquire the patient's trust and you can manage their longitudinal care, and it might not necessarily be through the old kind of model of that is my doctor, um, we want to get to a place where they identify our system as their ultimate provider. We will manage all aspects of their care. Um, but not in a, not necessarily in, in the traditional primary care panel. Can I just add maybe a different way of asking that question? Yeah. Is, what is the belief from a provider that they are the primary Yeah, continuity is critical, um, and and the um, the visibility and control of that continuous care uh, is different based on the customer type. Um, someone who is coming in for a longitudinal but episodic based incident like a knee, versus someone who has hypertension, diabetes, and is on chronic medication with episodic cases. Um, the point being that we hope to solve for that in a very cost-effective way that meets the customer where he or she is. I think the evolution of how we're receiving our drugs, how we're receiving our care, what uh, the continuity of care looks like, feels like, um, is, is changing very rapidly. Any other questions? Yeah. One more, last one, okay, sorry. Yeah. How do you get that shared So, yeah, you, you, on the payer landscape, you're there, you are their primary care in terms of the way the payers see it. I guess the, the point I was uh, trying to make was that um, while, A, I think the, pay, the payment systems won't evolve as fast as the delivery systems, but, and you have to find that marriage because you have to get paid. Um, Attribution will happen, and attribution does happen because we have primary care panels, and we will assign that. Um, but what we're building, what we're building, and how we're building, and how we're delivering the experience for the customer might not be as traditional as it was previously. Um, and also, uh, you don't. We we do have attribution, especially on the SMG side. Um, but for our initial retail model, we did not have attribution. And we solved uh, that payer issue in a uh, in a different way, uh, without attribution as well. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.